Okay, everybody, welcome back. We're on to week four. And this week we're going to talk about more partnerships. And this will all start coming together for you when we when we get to about week six or so, uh, when we start to specifically talk about problems in security and how to solve them. And understanding how all these partners work and what they can do for you is going to be critical to you uh, handling problems as a security manager, be it cybersecurity, uh, physical security, or some other form. Um, so we're going to talk about engineering, uh, which includes facilities. And then we're going to talk about IT partnerships. I don't go into as much detail with IT uh, for two reasons. Many of you have studied information technology in one form or another for several years now. Uh, and I don't want to bore you with the stuff that's so elementary that you'd pick right up on it. I think most people are pretty tech savvy and understand what IT does. I will go into it some, obviously. Um, but also I'm saving some of that for you to do as some homework. And the assignment this week is a little bit difficult, but uh, I'll talk you through it. And then we're going to meet in person next week and we'll talk about it there too. So what we hope to do this week is understand the basic functions of engineering facilities and IT partners. Um, we're going to talk about how those interface crossover. I'll use the term crossover quite a bit. Um, some of these things are risks that we share. <clears throat> others are synergies we share. Others are opportunities we share. Um, and we're going to talk about how those functions might uh, impact the security manager. We'll talk about risks that might be unique to engineering facilities and to IT, although there are many. We're just going to talk about a few to kind of get your creative juices flowing a little bit for the assignment. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we're going to talk about how we work with those partners in security and how we work uh, them into our enterprise security risk management model. When we're done this week, our ESRM family, and I think that's the way to really describe it, is going to include security and human resources, which we studied last week, and then IT, engineering, and facilities. And we'll be adding more to the uh, to the table. Uh, but once we're done with this week, we'll have a, a four-person family and growing. So as I said, we're not going to list every function of every engineering and facilities department. That probably would take 50 or 60 slides. And we can get very granular with that. But what I'd like to talk about is some high-level ones that are generally um, in the realm of engineering and facilities, no matter where you work, be it a government agency, be it a office building, a research lab, a manufacturing plant for autos or cell phones or whatever. Generally speaking, engineering facilities, they build and design new buildings. So at some point, your company's going to grow and they're going to need a new building or the building you have becomes obsolete. I'm working one right now in, in New York City. Uh, we've had a headquarters on 42nd Street and 2nd Avenue. I was just there um, for a very long time. We moved from Brooklyn, our original location, to New York probably 50, 60 years ago. And that building has become obsolete. It's very hard to heat and cool. Um, <clears throat> so uh, and expensive to do so. So we're building a new one in Hudson Yards, which is on the west side of Manhattan. And um, the engineering facilities people are knee deep in building design and construction, working with outside construction companies, obviously. You don't want to have a full size construction company, you know, inside your company, you hire one, but they do that design and construction when you have to expand or move. They also do space planning which is more important than you might think when it comes to security, because they tell you where everybody sits. So can you imagine, um, <clears throat> there are companies right now, they're doing something called hoteling, where you come into work and you grab a cart with your stuff in it, and you go to any desk and you sit down and you plug in, and you take your computer out of your little cart, it's a locked cart, and you fire it up and you plug in your phone to the jack that's there, and your phone number's already programmed because it's a soft phone anyway, and you're good to go. Um, but all those cubicles are the same. Can you imagine in a building where you had um, executive offices in the corner, cubicles for uh, middle management people, and perhaps a open pen type uh, work area for others? Can you imagine if you just said, just sit wherever you want, how many people try to get into that corner office uh, with all the amenities that come with that? Um, somebody has to control that and engineering facilities does. They also take care of all the repairs and maintenance, be it through your own people or through contractors. Right, small company is not going to have a plumber on staff, but somebody's in charge of facilities and operations. And when the sink stops working, they call the plumber and they coordinate that and they pay the bill. Um, but repairs and maintenance can be a huge, huge issue, and including security equipment, 
cooling equipment for data centers and, and server rooms, those types of things. So repairs and maintenance is a huge part of facilities and engineering. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, capital project management. <clears throat> and I don't know if, how much you guys know about capital versus expense. I'll try to do it as simply as I can. Capital projects are very big projects that you deduct from your corporate earnings, if you will, over time. Um, let's say you, you're a new company and you've been around for five years and your product's really taken off. And now you're making a million dollars a year in profit. Very nice for a small company startup, right? Five years in. Um, but you need a building. You don't have one. You were leasing something and now you've, you need to hire people in order to make that kind of money. Sometimes you have to spend it, right? And you had to hire people. And so you have to buy a building. Well, you found a nice building and it is $900,000. So do you really want to have on your corporate books when somebody comes to look and see how much you make that you make a million dollars one year and you only make profit 100000 the next year? Because you have to deduct the entire 900000 for the building you bought. In this way, and you don't want to take out a mortgage because then you have to pay interest on that. So you essentially write yourself a mortgage and you deduct the amount over a certain number of years so that your books don't look like you took a major hit or the business went bad. That's only one of the reasons there are certainly tax advantages to capital versus expense. Um, but capital projects, just in, in our terms, just think of them as big ticket items that you need that directly impact, impact your product or service. So if you are <clears throat> an IT company, if you're Google and you build a new Google data center, that would be a capital item. It directly impacts your product or service, and it's a big ticket item over you know, millions of dollars. Um, so capital projects are not small things like renovating a room or painting an office. It's building buildings and building large facilities and buying big pieces of machinery. They also handle utilities management. And if you want to think about whether or not that's important, think about the last time your power went out at your apartment or your home and what a pain in the backside that was. Well, can you imagine if that happened at a company that was trying to make money to make things with machinery that runs on electricity? Um, imagine how important utilities is. In my own business, pharmaceuticals, qualified utilities, steam, water. Can you imagine trying to make certain, part, certain uh, medicines without water? Clean, tested, uh, validated systems uh, giving you pure water are hugely important. And without those, we can't operate. So utilities management. So if you look down this list, there's some big things that engineering facilities do for your company. And they do some big things for you as a security manager. And in our ESRM model, we want to be able to return the favor. So we'll go over some of those. Now, if we shift to IT, and again, I think people in this class could probably make this list much better than I could. Um, make it more complete. And I probably forgot something big. I'd love to hear what that is, by the way, if I forgot something really big that IT does in your opinion or that you've studied and said, you know, this is part of our remit, um, definitely let me know. But generally speaking, at every business or nonprofit or government entity, IT is responsible for network architecture and availability. Everybody has to hook to a network and they are responsible for making sure that network is available, be it wired or wireless, um, and making sure that it is available for a, in such a way that it is robust enough to support your needs, right? You can put in a, you know, you can call, I don't know who you have in Pennsylvania. We have Comcast. I think you have Armstrong, uh, that's who I use at my house in Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken. I could call them and say, you know, Slippery Rock needs an internet connection. They'd be more than happy to come in and put in a, you know, a home modem and a router and charge us, you know, 50 bucks a month. But I'm thinking that you guys would be pretty disappointed when 6,000 students try to connect to that one hotspot. Um, and get their work done. So IT has to not only worry about the availability, but the architecture and the, the scope and scale of the network. Digital device provisioning, maintenance, and planning. <clears throat> That's something that, um, that most people don't really think about with IT, but who gives you your laptop and your cell phone and your, your hotspot if you need one and other digital devices that you might use? Uh, that is a function of IT and planning for that you imagine if you had 100 new employees start and you said, okay, now I'm going to go order 100 laptops. It's going to take a week or two for them to get there, get programmed, right? Get your protections put on them, um, get them set for your company standard, and nobody's working for those two weeks. Don't plan uh, for those things and you will look rather foolish. 
um, IT is, is concerned, obviously, with software and firmware vetting and assurance. That includes things like updates, making sure that people are using proper software. They're not using rogue software off the internet that they downloaded uh, for free. Um, you know, when you download a spreadsheet program uh, for nothing because you don't want to spend money on Excel, you are probably sharing your financial information with a whole lot of people in a foreign country that would love to have your information um, and are just, you know, chomping at the bit to empty your bank account. And IT <clears throat> is responsible for making sure that people put proper protections in, don't use rogue software, and when they have the proper software, that they have the most recent updates. IT capital project management, just like with engineering buying buildings, IT needs to set up data centers or spend money on a on a major software project. Uh, I mentioned SAP in our course uh, when we were together last. Um, it's a big program that a lot of companies use that goes you know from beginning to end of your processes it counts your raw materials and prints your checks and then takes care of your process automation for your manufacturing if you have manufacturing and then <clears throat> it takes care of all your shipping takes care of all your your billing to your customers all in one continuous program so that you can see as you move along someone with the right permissions can look and see you know, whether or not you have, you know, cash coming in, enough cash flow to, to, to handle operations, those types of things in one package. That would be an IT capital project for sure, because to do that for a mid-sized company, you would probably spend a million dollars. But being able to have a great visibility and have all those tests done by one system is a cost savings as well. There's process automation support. And depending on what your process is, Heck, you could work in a bottled water plant, but there is a automated process that makes sure that exactly 16 ounces of water go in those bottles. You don't have somebody with a measuring cup, right, pouring it in. You don't have little lines on there. Make sure somebody, the guy filling it, fills it to the lines. They go down a conveyor belt. They line up per perfectly. They get filled with 16 ounces. <clears throat> they go to the next spot where the cap is put on. Then the label's put on. Maybe that's not the right order of operations, but I think you get the picture. Process automation. Um, and then cybersecurity, or I think it's more accurate to say digital integrity overall, because it's not just protecting from outside. It's making sure that you don't have insiders who are improperly using your systems, um, <clears throat> making sure that the data that you use for business decisions or in the government for, you know, perhaps uh, national security um, data is indeed authentic and is not has not been compromised by somebody who's trying to make you read the wrong data. So cybersecurity, I don't know if you guys use the term digital integrity. I kind of like it because I think it takes in more than just firewalls and, and forensics for after the fact. It takes in everything to make sure that your data is indeed pristine and usable for what your purpose is. So how does this impact the security manager? I mean, we talked about what IT does and what engineering does, and security doesn't do any of those things. So... You know, heck, they can be down the hall doing their thing, and I'll be, you know, at the other end of the hall doing mine. Unfortunately, success doesn't come that way. Anything they do impacts you, and anything you do may impact them. Um, let's think about some of the risks associated with each, too, because one of the things that a good security manager can do is help identify risks. Now, again, we talked you don't own the risk, and the partners are supposed to bring those risks to you. But you've got to start thinking about how you're going to prompt them because the first conversation you have with somebody in another department saying, you know, what's the, what are your big risks? They're going to say, well, you know, I guess somebody could steal my stuff. I mean, they're not going to be, it's not that they're not forthcoming necessarily. They're not going to really speak the same language as you when it comes to risk. So there are some things you need to think about with those functions that we outlined and other functions that you can probably think of, what could be some risks, some crossovers, some things that, that match up with what you do to help protect the enterprise? There are very few places more important for using enterprise security risk management than building design and construction. And that includes new construction and renovations. Um, every time a building is modified, a new risk or vulnerability assessment needs to be done. And generally speaking, you will find, especially if there's been any penetration of the outside of the building, um, you'll find new risks have been opened up. So, you know, you're building a new building. Okay. <clears throat> well, what's going to be stored there? You have to ask that question. Why are we building this building? What are we going to put in there? Um, you know, the 
the example I gave when we met, you know, we built a, a pole barn warehouse somewhere here in, in the U.S. And when the security manager asked that question, what's going in there, it was uh, a huge amount of Paxlovid for COVID. A huge amount. And it was like, wait a minute, you built a pole barn, right? Uh, you can cut through the side of that with a Sawzall. I don't know if you guys know what a Sawzall is, but if you watch any home renovations, it's the thing that looks like a machine gun and then they, they touch it to, to anything. It just cuts it in half, right? Pipes, boards, it doesn't matter, this thing. But it doesn't make a clean cut, but it will definitely cut stuff. And you could do that with the side of one of these pole barns. It's just sheet metal on the outside. So it was like, no, no, you can't do that. So prompting that discussion, what's going in there, is was just enough for us to make a uh, decision that, from a security perspective, this was a really bad idea. But when you build something new or you're going to build and you're planning something, it's a valid question to say, well, what else is going in there? Right? We're going to put in there, we're going to put materials, we're just, we're just going to store, you know, old desks and, you know, um, you know, some building materials that we have. It's just a, it's just a barn to store excess stuff. Okay. And what else is going in there? Oh, well, you know, we're going to park the, we use gators, right? John Deere gators, those, those four, four wheel drive things that are really cool and fun to drive. Well, we use those for the grounds. We're going to put those in there. Okay. Well, those run about 12,000 a pop for a good one. Let's say we're going to put five of them in there. Now you're not talking old desks and used building materials anymore. You're talking $60,000 worth of vehicles that actually are desirable. And it doesn't take much for somebody to steal one, put it on a trailer, drive off with it, give it a little paint job, and you'll never see it again. So you've got to ask what's going to be housed in the building. Did the renovation make a protected resource more vulnerable? So now we're talking about an existing building where you've done all your your security stuff and you've got you know your perimeter set up properly and you've got you know your important stuff in room A and some more important stuff in room B and you've got them protected with cameras and card readers and things. But if somebody goes in and makes a renovation because they're going to make room A bigger, that may require them to put in another emergency exit. When you make things bigger, fire code changes and you may have to put another door in. Well, when you put a door in and you don't protect that door, haven't you just opened a major vulnerability to room A? You certainly have. Because all of a sudden a door shows up. Now, I have seen that happen. I have seen renovations, even minor modifications in a, a server room where the IT folks have put additional racks in. And when they made that modification and put in the additional racks and they were tall racks, they blocked every camera view I had. The camera was staring, originally was staring at the door and into the server room where I could see activity in there. And if there was any misbehavior, we'd have it on, on tape video. Um, and when they did the modification and the renovation, they moved the racks right in front of the camera, didn't say anything. And for several weeks, the guards were just putting in work orders saying the car, the camera's not working. It was working proper, properly. It was just looking 12 inches at the side of a gray painted rack. So, you know, renovations will open up vulnerabilities and you need to think about that. When you're doing new building design, <clears throat> this may be a new term for many of you, crime prevention through environmental design. Um, it is something that physical security managers get very good at. It is a skill set. It is something you learn, but it is using um, building design to increase your security. For instance, um, if you go to just about any courthouse built in the last 25 years, you will notice that there will be stairs out front. There'll be a ramp, right? Because ADA requires a ramp, but there will be stairs. Why do you need stairs or more than one stair? right? Normally they have a rather long staircase. And out front, you'll notice that they have big, heavy planters full of flowers. Now, isn't that pretty? We all like flowers. But those big, heavy planters are precast concrete, weighted in the bottom, full of soil. And when you try to run your car into the courthouse, the planter wins and your car loses. The same with the stairs, the length of the stairs. I just uh, last week went to do design of a building in New York, a new facility where we're going to house some executives, and they're going to make a modification in the front, and I asked them to extend the stairwell, right, to, to turn it to at an angle and to put planters out in front uh, for that very purpose. Crime prevention through environmental design, when you're building a big facility, sometimes you see ponds out in front of a facility and a road that goes in a kind of a zigzag serpentine kind of a, a driveway rather than a straight driveway coming in. A lot of that stuff is for security purposes. Nobody's going to drive up to your building 
or try to attack it through the pond. Now, they could. People can swim. They can get a little boat, right? Those ponds that you see out in front, they usually have really nice fountains, but the bottom is always muck. And it's fun to watch people when they get in those things. But the the generally speaking, those things are designed so the roads that turn when you go into a you know a long driveway, that's meant to slow you down. And it's slowing you down for security purposes. It's slowing you down in some cases so that we can get more camera angles on you. Along the drive, there may be cameras so we can see from different angles. If you're just coming in straight, it may be hard to see what's in the back seat. But if you're coming at a turn, now you've turned the car and I've got my camera angle to the side for a little bit longer than just if you drove by it. So crime prevention through environmental design is just that. You're trying to reduce crime by designing your buildings, your facilities, even your city, the way it's laid out. You can lower crime by designing it right, and that comes into building design and construction. You need to have a, a seat at the table for new construction, okay? Whatever type of security manager you are, if you can get a seat with engineering when they have new construction meetings and they take a very long time doing one route, now the spend is $480 million on a new facility. We will have these planning meetings for three years before anybody ever swings a hammer or uses a backhoe to dig the first dirt so that we can work together to properly secure the building before it ever goes up. And if you don't have that seat at the table, you're going to get handed a building or a system or something that has no security protections built in whatsoever, and you're starting from scratch, and it makes your job much harder. So very few people think about space planning and where people sit as a security issue, but it certainly is. Think about executives and human resources, medical, if you have an occupational health you know, company nurse, there was a vulnerable partners, executives, <clears throat> companies that have a, you know that don't do well in the news or have a controversial product, a product line. Those executives generally have generally have executive protection. Do you really want them in the front corner office, right on the ground level, looking out at the parking lot? Probably not. Um, you know, I'll use the term sniper because that's what will happen or could happen. You don't want to put your executives right out front in that front corner office on a lower floor. You want them on a higher floor, generally speaking, facing the back of the facility where there is no parking. Um, they, that gives them a better view, generally, and makes them safer. HR, same way. Do you want to bury your HR? We, we talked about HR and hiring and firing, right? HR always assists with terminations. They generally sit with the manager when someone is terminated. Now, would you want your HR department to be way down deep in the basement of your facility, about uh, 200 yards from the, from the outside walls, right in the center? Or would you rather have them on the fringe so that when somebody gets terminated, you can say, okay, Brian's going to walk you to your car now. We've already cleaned out your desk. and He's got a, your, your personal stuff in a box. If there's anything missing, let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to search for it. But all your pictures of, you know, little Johnny playing baseball and your, your car keys and your coat and your lunchbox you brought in is right here in this box. And we're going to walk you out and we're going to that door right there because there's an outside entrance. So now HR, space planning, you want close to the outside. <clears throat> Medical, think about the company nurse. Uh, you know, as the oldest member of our cohort here, since you are all young and beautiful, you got a guy like me who's in the office and all of a sudden I'm not feeling well. I grip my chest and I go down to the nurse's office and I say, I don't know, something's wrong here. Uh, boom, and I hit the ground. How far from the outside door do you want me to be? Well, don't answer that question. How far from the outside door should I be? Right? You want me close? You want to make sure that there's unobstructed access to me? Right? You don't want the, you don't want the, uh, the guys with the gurney to have to get on an elevator with it because the elevator car may not be big enough for all the equipment they're bringing up. You don't want them to have to turn all kinds of corners. You don't want to have to wheel me through the cafeteria to get out. So medical needs to be in a certain place. And there are many other. Um, you don't want your cybersecurity center, you know, sitting on the outside where somebody could try to tap into your wireless, right? You want to have a Faraday cage or something built around that, generally speaking. How about cube farms? You've all been in, you know, you've seen, I imagine most of you've seen Office Space. It's one of my favorite movies. But, you know, everybody's sitting in a cubicle. Don't, you know, loose lips sink ships, right? You and I are having a private conversation about some big project coming up and, you know, Bill's on the other side of the wall listening right in. Should some functions have enclosed offices for security reasons? Doors, windows, window film. There are window films you can put on that make it impossible for you to use a listening device. 
Um, if anybody's interested in that, I've got a guy who's a former Secret Service guy. He'd love to talk to you about the stuff. He's doing a project on it now, and he can tell you what he's doing. Um, but if you think about cube farms are very common and from a, from an information security and from a from a theft perspective they really are a, a terrible idea but they are very efficient you can pack people in and use less office space and they're easy to heat and cool because you don't have individual rooms so engineering likes cube farms generally speaking so you know as a security manager you need to work with engineering to talk about whether or not those are a good idea and how about the space for your own security needs right uh, you read an article on UL listing, and it talked about how a security command center needs to be, you know, interior to a facility, you know, with a floor it needs to be on, the amenities it needs to have. Um, if you don't coordinate with engineering on space planning, space assignment, and space needs for yourself, uh, you definitely, again, are doing work twice. When we talk about repairs and maintenance, it's a great opportunity for security, especially, especially physical security, although also for those in information with automated systems to work hand in hand with engineering in an enterprise security risk management and an enterprise uh, engineering preventative maintenance type stance, right? Again, we're, we're kind of looking at this holistically, right? I will tell you that repair shops are theft magnets, okay? Cafeteria supply rooms and repair shops. Why is that? Well. People like food, people like batteries and tape and office supplies. And in repair shops, there are tools, um, people working on things from home. You know, I need to go work on this. I, I, you know, had all the tools I thought, but I need a drill and my drill busted. I'm, you know, I spent all my money on materials. They go steal a drill. They really, they really are a theft magnet. Many large repair shops have things like piping. If you're in manufacturing, you may have copper pipe sitting in a rack. Well, copper has value, a lot of value, by the way. Um, and we'll talk about that when it comes to construction sites. Um, but if you can properly secure the repair shop, put a card reader on it, special lock on it, camera to see who's going in and out, you actually make friends because the repair shop guys, you know, the last thing you want to do is you're working on a plumbing project and you're almost done. You need one piece of copper pipe and you go back and find out it's all been stolen, right? You can help prevent that and make friends and influence people that way. Um, is there a way for security patrols to aid in the identification of minor repair stuff, right? You've got guards. You, you know that when, when guards are in a large facility, they generally do watch tour rounds, right? They walk around in a set pattern or a random pattern, but they go to, to each area every couple of hours, right, to cover an entire facility. Well, that means walking through mechanical spaces. And as you probably can imagine, there are lots of mechanical spaces in big buildings. Every building at Slippery Rock uh, University has some kind of a mechanical room and some of them are really large. The big buildings have, you know, gosh, I mean, they've got a, a, a electrical distribution and heating and cooling systems and everything. Um, many of them have belts and dials and readouts. The guards could work with engineering and say, well, you know, we're there every two hours. Why have somebody else go do that? And then there's the opportunity to train profession, uh, maintenance people on security stuff, right? Um, it's not unusual. Do you really want to call a locksmith every time a lock goes bad if you have a maintenance guy who's pretty handy who can learn to be a locksmith? So, you know, working together with engineering, um, security has some real opportunities there to, to save some money, to save some time, and to, to better protect the enterprise overall. Now, in capital project management, um, if you're building a building, you know, I mentioned copper. Well, when you bring in, when you put a new building together, uh, it used to be you just had to put in the electric and the telephones, but now you're putting in all kinds of network cabling, right? Uh, you, you cat six stuff going everywhere. You've got uh, Romex cable going everywhere for electric. You've got all kinds of cabling and a lot of it is either copper or other precious metal, depending on what you're putting in. And it's not like they're bringing in extension cords, guys. For a big building, you have six foot tall or four foot tall, depending on you know, where you get it and what you, what you need it for, rolls of this wiring. And it disappears off construction sites because it is so easy to fence, right? They strip it out the plastic. They've got pure copper and it's easy to sell. And copper, all precious metals are up right now, at least, uh, at least this year. Um, and so it's a very lucrative business to steal. On a capital project, you're going to have to put guards on 
stuff. It means that when they when they put a building together, they're still working on the inside. The building is open a good portion of the time. Do you want people wandering through for safety reasons in the middle of the night? Um, when you have when you finally get the shell up and the doors closed, you're still going to have to open them up for prolonged periods of time to bring in equipment. And then the rest of the stuff you've already brought in is vulnerable because somebody could wander in and steal that and take it out the same door. So you're going to have to have the cost for guards. And those go against the capital project. But again, you're working hand in hand with engineering to say, when are you bringing stuff in? What are you bringing in? And then what's the impact if that stuff disappears? Now, they may say that, you know, look, the wiring we're bringing in here, you know, wiring's pretty easy to get. We're going to lock it up and, you know, we're going to chain it down, but we don't need a guard there for it because if it does disappear, you know, it's unlikely if we get it chained down that somebody will be able to steal it. And if they do, um, we can always get more. We're going to take that risk. But generally speaking, you're going to have some costs. Same way with a renovation, a major project may create vulnerabilities during the project execution, right? Doors left open. You're bringing in all kinds of people that you don't know who they are to work on things. And some of them are only there for three or four days. You know, a finished carpenter may go in to finish out 10 rooms, right? 10 executive offices with, uh, with high-end mahogany trim, right? He's going to be there for two weeks doing the trim work in the executive offices. You're never going to see that guy again, and he's never going to see you. And it's not someone who you will have a background check on. He's coming in from a service. And security may need to understand where he can get to. How do you lock them out of certain areas, right? And then the term turnkey project, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, but a turnkey project is like um, building a house, right? You go to one person and you say, build me a house. <clears throat> you sit down with them. You tell them what your needs are. They show you the blueprints. You say, yep, that's good. You pick out your colors and your finishes and your your carpets and your flooring and, um, you know, what types of windows you're going to have, all those types of things. And then they take care of everything. You don't have to go out and hire a window guy and a carpet guy and a flooring guy and a guy to put the door and hang the door straight and somebody to paint the inside. It's all done turnkey. You pay one, one person, they take care of everything. Turnkey projects, once they're signed, that's what you get. So if you have a project, if your engineering department says, we're going to build a new new building, an important question to ask is, is this turnkey or are we doing it you know, piece by piece ourselves? Are we bringing in different people to do things? Who's managing that? And if it is a turnkey project managed by an outside project management firm, you definitely want to be in on those conversations because once they sign a contract to say, this is what we want, that is what you get. And any changes are going to be expensive and hard to sell. And so, again, that seat at the table is really important in that game. And finally, on the engineering side, you've got utilities maintenance. If you shut down the utilities, you might shut down everything. So, you know, power goes out, power goes out, unless you have a big generator, which many companies, many businesses do. If you drive around the back of many commercial buildings, you'll see a big generator. It's a <clears throat> generally a 8-foot, 9-foot tall box, probably about 8 by 10 uh, footprint metal box. It'll have high voltage on it. It's a generator. It runs on a in in the ground tank normally of of uh, diesel fuel, and it'll run for X number of hours. But wouldn't you want to make sure that that's protected? Because if the power does go out and somebody has you know jacked around with your with your um, generator, then you're not going to have any power, and you spent all that money and time, and you planned on having that generated power to keep your things going. So there, right, right in and of itself is a security concern. Is the generator protected? Do you know if somebody approaches? Is there a camera on it? Is there a fence around it? Um, how about utility feeds? <clears throat> Interesting. Uh, I went to a site in uh, somewhere in Iowa. can't remember even where it was. Elk something. Uh, you know, small town, two pumps and a clean restroom and a warehouse where they were uh, housing and distributing medicated feeds for farm animals. It was a division of the company I worked for. And when I got there, I asked one of the questions, what about utilities? Where do the utilities come in? Do you have more than one feed? And when you say more than one feed, you have a, to your house or your apartment, you have one feed, generally speaking. It's coming in from the street. If you, some, if you have overhead lines, you can see it coming in, the wiring goes to the building. Most likely these days it's underground, but it's one. When you have a major commercial facility, you want multiple feeds. Just in case, some, suppose somebody hits that pole, 
right? That it's coming in on and the power goes out. Well, now you got to wait and get power when somebody can erect the pole. Wait, if it's wintertime, the ground's frozen. You can't put another pole up. So it's going to be a while. If you have redundant feeds, right, multiple feeds of power coming in from different sides, if one of them gets compromised, the other one gives you enough power to survive, and you just switch to that one. Well, in this, this facility in Elk Whatever, uh, Iowa, um, they told me they had redundant feeds. I said, okay, that's great. Let's trace them. Where did they come in? Well, one came in off one county road, and another one came off of another city street. But unfortunately, they both converged at the same pole just before they went in the building. So they really didn't have, you know, um, redundant feeds. And <laughs> the funny thing was that this pole was right outside of a loading dock where they backed up the big trucks to load them with this feed. And every truck that backed up, because they only had like a single bay dock, every truck that backed up came within four or five feet of that utility pole. So one tired truck driver who misjudges and hits that pole would take out power from both feeds to the building because it came in the same spot. I just found that to be kind of funny um, for a minute. And then I said, okay, now you need to get that pole out of there and reroute the power. Um, but you need to understand whether or not they have utility feeds that are protected. Um, and is utility recovery part of crisis planning, right? Your engineering department is in charge of utilities. And what if the local power company, right? What if Penn Power just says, look, we, we lost all the ability to generate power for the next three weeks because our power plant went offline, right? Nuclear power plants go offline when there's an accident and, you know, there are other sources, but maybe there's not going to be another source. Crisis planning generally falls to security. So is it part of crisis planning? Refrigeration, heating, uh, temperature for products, all of those things fall into, into that utilities maintenance and they could be hugely important depending on what your product is. And then does the security system itself, your own stuff, your access system, your access cards, your alarm system, your cameras, are they on any kind of backup power? You know, oftentimes the, the utility people have the generator and they only hook it to what they consider to be critical. So it may be used to run the, you know, the lights and refrigeration and they've sized it so it runs the heat so you don't freeze yourself out of there in the wintertime if you have electric heat or electric uh, blowers on heat. But it was never sized to handle the network or to handle security cameras, which may be on the network or maybe on its own backbone, or access systems. You need to understand and, and have a great relationship with engineering so that you can understand your vulnerabilities to your own equipment when it comes to utilities. So let's take these things real quick. I'm not going to belabor them, uh, but let's take a look and see how these, these things, these different functions of engineering might impact others, not just security, or all tie in together with the rest of the ESRM family. So shut down the utilities. If the power goes out, well, most of the time, HR is going to say, send some, send people home. We, we don't have anything to do with them, right? I mean, if the power, if you work in the mall, right, work over at the, at the uh, outlet malls, and the whole place goes dark, <clears throat> is your employer going to tell you to, you know, stick around? Maybe for a little while, see if it comes back on. But generally speaking, if they know the power is not coming back on that day, then you're going home. Do people get paid? In many companies, they do. Once you've arrived at work, if you're sent home because of a facility issue or a production issue, whatever, you're guaranteed X number of hours of pay or a full day's pay. So, but HR has to worry about paying people, right? As does finance, right? Just in time deliveries. What about when the power goes out? We're back, you know, we're, we're at that shutdown of utilities and trucks show up and they want to unload because, you know, you've got uh, materials coming in and you can't get the doors open. Overhead doors are electric and you can't get them open. Or you can't see or you can't run the electric forklift, right? Because it isn't charged. So you can't you can't move it. Well, I mean, there are so many things. Same with security. Can I operate my security control center? So let's take a look at the other functions in engineering real quick, and then we'll jump to IT and think about some of the things that tie into the security manager in, in each of these engineering functions and why you need to have that tight relationship. So in building design, you know, protecting employees, deterring costs associated with vandalism. If you build the building right, certainly a tie into security there. As we talked about, space planning, protecting the, the executives. And if an executive at a, at a major corporation gets kidnapped, or even if someone gets into their office 
and I have seen this at other companies, and I've actually seen a number of kidnappings uh, of executives. Generally speaking, that happens in Latin America. It's very big business there. Um, and most of the time, they kidnap an executive, and they either take them to an ATM. It's an express kidnapping, it's called. And they take them to an ATM and have them empty out their bank account, take them that money, and then release them. But they target them because they're executives. Or they ask for a ransom that is more along the lines of the local economy. So uh, Shell Oil had an um, executive kidnapped in Mexico, and the kidnappers demanded a ransom of $25,000. And you know my, my counterpart at Shell laughed, and he said, gosh, if I, if I was thinking, I would have said, okay, I'll pay it, but you've got to deliver them into the United States because it was cheaper. $25,000 was, was less than sending a corporate jet to pick him up. Um, but space planning and space assignment could, you know, could compromise your employees, put them in a position where they could get hurt. Um, repairs and maintenance, if you can't, you can't produce without, uh, with bad machinery, employees might get laid off. Profits drop when people are laid off. They tend to not like the company. And then as a security manager, you've got the threat and the risk of an employee coming back, blaming the company because they're losing their house because the place wasn't well maintained. And the same thing with capital equipment. You could run into tax issues, workers are idle. And again, that all of those things add to the security manager's woes. I'm sure you have lots of questions on this stuff. And there's a few answers out there, but you're going to build some of those as part of your assignment coming up. But it's important you build an authentic and synergistic relationship with engineering facilities. The good thing about it from the physical security side is generally speaking, uh, I went, well, I can't say that. I would say often physical security managers report into engineering and facilities because it's considered a facility's function. They may also report to other functions like safety, um, sometimes to IT if you have a converged security program, both physical and cyber. Um, but um, for the most part, security, physical security is considered a facility's function. So a lot of times you report to them, but you have to have that relationship. Okay, and in order to build that relationship, just let me give you a quick hint. Engineering people need to get around the facility. They need to get around the facility efficiently. And I will tell you that I've seen many security managers tell engineering people, no, you can't have access to that. No, you'll have to go around. No, you can't cut through there. We don't allow that. Look at these things as one-offs and understand whether or not telling that person that they can't do something is going to hurt you when it comes to that relationship that you so desperately need to be successful. If you are the security manager, you can make exceptions. And this is something that we talk about in physical security courses all the time, is that you know people become very rigid. No, only people who work in Building 300 can have access to Building 300 to get in. The maintenance people that work over in Building 200 can't have access to there. Well, maybe this, the tools are sto stored in 300. Maybe the person in 200 needs to go help the guy in 300 fix something. And when they ask for access to the building and you say no because you're rigid about it, you will lose and you will lose that relationship. The guy with the wrench matters. They really do. They will make you successful or make you a chump because they will do things. To, you know, All of a sudden, your security control center goes dark for a few hours. Oh, we were testing the generator. It didn't work, so it went dark. Well, nobody told me. Oh, we, you know, we, we forgot. Build those relationships. Make sure that you have them in place. Let's talk a little bit about IT, and then I'm going to tell you what the assignment is because you're going to help fill in the blanks on the IT side. I think you guys are up to it, and if you fall flat on your face, so be it. That's why we do it, so that you fall flat on your face here in class rather than at the real big guy job. So as we started off, these are the basic functions of IT. You saw this in the same slide earlier on. Um, just to refresh your memory, again, these are just six functions. There are lots more, I'm sure. And I honestly would love to have your input when we meet next to say, hey, you kind of forgot about this and you kind of forgot about that because uh, that only helps me become a better security professional. And then maybe we can just use those things to talk about um, when we meet uh, about how to, how to figure out what those synergies might be. So here's the six functions that we want to talk about. So in network architecture and availability, especially in new construction, IT is going to be responsible for ensuring that the, the networks are right-sized. Voice, data, I mean, can you imagine if, if somebody didn't plan that, right? IT plans, 
and this is how they meld in with engineering and maintenance, right? They will plan the size and the scope and the scale and the route of the network. They also then are responsible for uptime on those networks. And I'm sure you guys have, have uh, um, talked about that in your other classes. Continuity plans are going to tell us what functions are critical and restored first in an outage. So business continuity plans, a lot of times fall to security. There's a little tie in there. Um, but uh, the IT folks need to determine what comes back first. When things go down, what comes back first? Is it, you know, are the, are the lights all on sensors and the network goes completely down and you need to fire it back up and you need to fire it back up in stages? Well, what are you, are you running building systems? Maybe. So, you know, you could fire up the email, but if it's 40 degrees inside your building and that building automation systems on the network, I'd fire that up first because people aren't going to use their email if they're sitting at home because they're freezing to death in the office, right? Networks need power. And IT and others determine what functions need backup power. Just like we want to um, um, generate our coverage for our security control center, they want it. And they're going to help determine with others, you know, what stuff is critical when it comes to the network. The one that many people forget when it comes to IT, digital device provisioning, maintenance, and planning. So, you know, everybody pretty much when you go to work these days, you get a laptop, you get a phone, you might get a cell phone too, printers, monitors. Let's just say that you just said it, told everybody, look, when you need those things, go get what you want. You know, here's your company credit card. You're going to need a computer. You're going to need a cell phone. So basically, you know, I get a MacBook Air and you get a Lenovo uh, Windows PC and I get an iPhone and you get a Galaxy flip phone running on Android. And can you imagine how much IT infrastructure and software and testing you would have to do if everybody just chose what they wanted? I mean, heck, somebody could say, I really want a BlackBerry. Now you've got to set up security for Blackberries again, right? Which they are still alive, believe it or not. Um, they also work on the lifecycle management of digital devices. Can you imagine if you worked for a company and they said, okay, well, you know, you, you have an iPhone 13 and you got it. And now the iPhone 14 is out. Oh, well, I'm going to get a new one of those. And everybody ran down and got a new one every time they wanted to. The lifecycle management program normally will say that IT has determined that you need a new cell phone every two years or every three years or every year, depending on what your company does and, you know, what the functions are. But you don't say every time a new model comes out, run down and get one. And then, of course, you have to worry about, you know, vetting that for your network. And then the break, fix, and response time decisions on digital equipment. What gets fixed first? I will tell you that if my laptop goes down at the same time the ones in finance do, finance is going to get theirs fixed first. That's a really basic, you know, use case there. But the digital device, the device provisioning, maintenance, and planning all takes those things into account and understands what goes first, when people can get new stuff, and what stuff they should be getting, what the company standards are. Software, firmware, vetting, assurance, so licensing and version updates. Um, I in, in the security world, I can tell you that oftentimes local security managers will not get the updates that they, they, they just don't opt for them. Right. They may pay for them out of their own security budget and the security system that runs their cameras comes out with a new version of software. You know, you were on 5.0, now we're coming out with 5.1. They say, eh, I'm not going to spend $5,000 to get 5.1 installed. I'll just skip that one. And 5.1 happens to have the patch that fixes the cybersecurity vulnerabilities for whatever. If, if IT did not keep a handle on those things and mandate that people keep you know, up to date on licensing and versions, the average uh, worker would not do it. We don't, we don't always update. I mean, you guys may, but I will tell you, I have nightly updates on my, on my uh, Apple computer, but I have other devices that I just go in and I do the updates when I see one. Uh, updates on apps that I use on my phone. Um, you know, if you don't go in and set it to automatic, once you go in, it'll tell you, you have 37 apps that need updates. And then one day you just wait and sit for 20 minutes and let them load, right? IT is responsible for making sure that people don't do stuff like that. They make sure that we only own one type of stuff. Can you imagine if I liked, uh, you like, um, um, you know, Outlook mail and I prefer Gmail 
and somebody else likes, uh, you know, uh, oh, well, I, I prefer this type of a male client. Can you imagine if everybody picked their own tools? Making sure that everybody uses the same software and, and firmware tools, right? Same software tools especially is important function of IT. And then building and bundling suites of those products when possible, right? Anytime you can buy a single, like like Office Suite, right? The Office Suite of products. People buy that because it, it covers so many things when you buy that one suite of products. But again, if everybody went out and bought Word, then went out and bought Excel, then went out and bought uh, Access, and went out and bought this and this and this and this, it would get, become extremely expensive. You'd have multiple versions of, of things running on people's machines. And IT is responsible for making sure that we do the right things when it comes to buying software and products and tools that we're going to use digitally so that they are fit for purpose, that they are acceptable on the network, and that we only have the minimum number of them that we they absolutely need because why would you have more than you need? IT capital project management, right? The long-term spending on infrastructure. If you don't update your infrastructure, if you don't make it scalable, if you don't make it grow, then your company's going to eventually run into issues with with uh, uh, bandwidth, if nothing else, right? So IT capital project management takes care of the long-term spending on the infrastructure to make sure you have everything you need when you need it. And then they coordinate with other functions like security, physical security in support of capital projects with a digital need. So when I go out and buy a visitor management system, which I just bought that I'm going to use for 140 locations, and it's a software as a service, it runs about $2,000 per year per location. So we're looking at, uh, you know, 300, 380,000, by the time you're done, we're looking at half a million dollars a year for a visitor management system. You know, it's a big company and it's multinational. But I need IT to coordinate that for me because there are different uh, different rules in different countries. Uh, there are ways it can be hooked up. Does it run off of our server? Does it run totally off of somebody else's server? All those types of big projects, they're not just IT projects. They are projects that others are doing. You know, an, an automation project to automate some big piece of machinery is not really an IT project that helps the IT infrastructure but it helps the business. So IT capital projects take in both infrastructure and then the needs of others. Process automation, two sides really to it. Manufacturing support, the types of computer-aided processes that help you make your product or service. And then facility support, building automation systems that keep air conditioning, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, water systems, um, cooling systems of other types, right? All those things running um, process automation support is a basic function of IT no matter where you go. Uh, it's quite lucrative too for those of you who are, you know, getting into that type of, of, um, of field. Uh, don't, uh, don't just look at, um, you know, other types of automation and other types of, of information technology. The information technology around automation support, even facility support, is very lucrative because there's, it's done everywhere. Everybody has automated systems that, that control their buildings. And that is a huge function of IT. So cybersecurity or digital integrity, I'm going to preach to the choir here. You guys know this stuff better than me, most of you in the class anyway. And for those of you on the on the physical security side, this, these are just some of the basics, right? Firewalls, password protections, access and identity management, the digital side anyway, right? Um, you're making sure that only people who have proper training and need can access your network, just like in the physical side, we make sure that only people who have the proper training and need can access our physical um, assets. Penetration testing, right? Testing to see if hackers can get into something. Pretty much it. I mean, I'm sure you have a much better definition than I do, but it's a basic cybersecurity and IT function at many companies. Virus and cyber attack monitoring and protections, a little different. Now you're just watching the network, right? You've got systems that are monitoring the network and seeing what's hitting on it. Um, I think I had somebody in our uh, cybersecurity department say they get uh, 10 or 12,000 uh, rogue hits on our network a day. It's an incredible amount. It could be more than that. Uh, I will check on that, and hopefully I'll have that number for you when we meet next week. Um, but it's an amazing number of, of people, entities, um, and automation that's hitting the network trying to attack it on a regular basis, and IT takes care of that. And then cybersecurity or information security awareness. 
right? Making sure that employees understand what their responsibilities are and what what types of things are going bump in the night that can hurt them. Certainly part of that overall digital integrity, cybersecurity type program with IT. So those are the basic functions of the IT department. Again, for those of you who are studying it, um, you may know more. Um, and if I got anything wrong, I'll apologize and you can tell me about it. But I think these are just the basic functions that most people associate with IT in a business. So let's go through just in brief though, because uh, we're only going to do two of them, the same exercise. When we talk about uh, IT as an ESRM partner, there are shared risks and shared mitigation opportunities. Um, think about the types of IT services that the physical security manager might use. Uh, you know, how important is that relationship with IT? And I will tell you, it's critically important, so much so that I generally spend in a 40-hour week, although I don't think I've ever worked a 40-hour week in my life. It's been closer to 50 or 60. Um, but I generally spend about 10% of my time working with people in IT in our digital space um, simply to talk about my own systems and what we need to do to keep them up and running and protected. Um, so let's talk about how you can you can work ESRM into that relationship with IT in just two of those instances. So the new construction, the new construction that we talked about, uh, IT is responsible for ensuring the communications and voice and data networks are right sized. Well, I will tell you that video systems, camera systems are big bandwidth users, especially if you're bringing them over, um, you know, large distances. The, the, the cameras today are getting better, but they don't package data very well. And so it's coming across in very large packets and they're big bandwidth users. And if you have a small facility with a, you know, limited infrastructure and maybe it is a commercial, if people are using VPN to, to use your network, maybe they're using a commercial network at, at a small facility, um, you don't want to be streaming 8, 10, 12 cameras full time. Videos could get dropped, right? Surveillance then gets dropped. Maybe that surveillance is of a data center, right? Ironically, you're streaming so much video at the data center that you're slowing things down at the data center, right? Because you're sharing servers with others. Um, IT could take the flack for slow network because you're hogging bandwidth. So working with IT in that regard, there's a shared concern and a shared risk, and you work together to, to fix that. Um, the uptime on the network, well, do you have any dog in that fight? Let me tell you what, when people, when the network goes down, generally speaking, people don't, <laughs> they keep on working. They just go ahead and use their home network or their hotspot on their phone and use their home email to send important and sensitive documents around the world. There's a big um, potential for misbehavior. Um, networks need power. Okay, will my monitoring center, my, my security monitoring center go out? When power goes out, IT and others member determine what functions need backup power and which can go dark in an emergency. Um, could it be that, ironically, when they say, well, we don't need to worry about the security cameras, you know, if it goes out, well, the security cameras are monitoring IT areas. So working together in this ESRM model to talk up together about what problems could occur, what keeps them up at night, and then what things you have thought about that could be a potential problem. Working together, you can solve that problem and both be happy with the result in that, you know, maybe you have to adjust your, your bandwidth on your cameras. Maybe your frame rate's too high and they can help you with that. And then you're, you won't have to worry about bogging the network down. It's just an example. Let's look at one more and then I'm going to tell you what I want you to do for homework. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to rain on your parade and I'm going to do the cybersecurity or digital integrity one because I think it would be the easiest one for you all to do yourselves. Uh, but I want to challenge you a little bit. So when we talked about cybersecurity, we said firewalls, password protections, access and identity management, digital access and identity management is all part of that game. Well, I have identity management to worry about too. Do I not physically? I mean, I want to make sure that the person who is coming into my building is that person. So maybe I can partner with the IT people to say, you know, maybe we have after hours a card reader that also requires people to put in their network access code, right? Their password, their network ID, and their password. There are such there are such things to get in certain areas. Now we're merging our need for access and identity management. Um, cameras and card readers that are used in physical security are edge devices now. 
They really are. They're an IoT device. Um, they all have passwords on them. I mentioned this to you last time we met. Um, it's a horror show. Passwords are seldom changed on those things. Again, a risk that is shared by IT because the network could be compromised because of something that the physical security person did or did not do. Um, one thing that uh, that is uh, probably not known to most of you on the physical security side in investigations, we spend a fair amount of time out on the web, right? Looking for people, looking for clues in cases, looking for at people's social media and on the dark web, looking for people wanting to buy counterfeits, people who are selling stolen property from our businesses. If indeed we don't work with the IT people and we do that on our own, do you imagine what the vulnerabilities would be if I sat at my desk and just started, you know, loaded my own Tor browser and just started going out there looking at the dark web to try to, you know, uncover uh, counterfeit products and didn't tell the IT people? Um, they would never know that I was out there doing that until they got attacked, most likely. Um, so coordination, again, on those common things that you need and the things they can help you with as you're discussing the things that keep them up at night. Both functions really are responsible for security awareness, be it cybersecurity awareness or physical security awareness, personnel security awareness. And maybe there's some opportunities for convergence in that space where when you're educating people, you only have to do it once. You give them the spiel about their security, whether they're online or they're in person right, and do it in one converged way. That is a way that you can work with the IT people to solve both your problem and their problem, which is getting people to understand vulnerabilities and how they can better protect themselves and the company. So, you know, from a from an ESRM perspective, that relationship with IT is hugely important and it's very synergistic back and forth. They need to help us protect ourselves and we need to help them protect themselves. So a long lecture this week and a little bit tougher of an assignment this week, but then next week we're going to meet in person and we're going to go over it again. And I won't grade it until um, you still have to have it in on time, but I won't grade it until after we meet if you may want to make some tweaks to it or better understand it. But I want you to take a, a shot at it. So you're all done with the lecture. There were a couple of readings. There were about security facilities um, that you might find them boring if you are not a corporate security major. And even if you are, but I think if you're going to be a safety person or a cybersecurity person understanding how ul sets things up and how engineering plays a part in the success of setting up a security command center is pretty important there's a discussion it's not easy it there you do need to put an initial post which will be an essay at 5 p.m on thursday and then response one response this week to somebody is due on sunday at 11 59 p.m in that assignment you're going to take two more of those slides. What I did was when I was going over the slides, I told you what the functions were, and then I went back and told you about some of the synergies, some of the common concerns, some of the ways that security managers work with people on each one of those functions. And we have three more or four more functions. I think there are four more functions in IT that we did not go over like we did the last two to talk about them in detail. I would like you to add the detail. So what you're going to do is take a couple of those slides, and I've numbered them, and you can pull them off of the, uh, the slide deck that I attach. And I want you to go through the slide and add in the bullet points just like I did back, like here, right? This was the original statement that was in the slide on network architecture. And then we talked about some of the risks, right? What, what are those risks? What are those common synergies between the security department and IT? And we talked about, you know, new construction, they have to make sure that communications is right size. Well, you know, I've got communications. I've got video systems that, that are big bandwidth hogs. They just are because they're not, it's not like Netflix who has it down to a science that can stream a, uh, a video to your home and it just sips bandwidth, you know, realistically. When you're using security cameras, it doesn't have all that infrastructure and packeting and things to make it smaller. It's just a lot of raw data. Well, so we talked about the risk. We talked about some synergies here, um, about the misbehavior. Uh, what I want you to do is to take in your assignment to go back and take the slides. And the, 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 I think that the description I put in the, um, in the assignment, in the discussion assignment, is pretty straightforward. Take two of those slides, 
put in your own bullet points. What do you think? And then you translate that into an essay of 250 words. It's not easy, but I want you to take a shot at it. You certainly can work with other people. Um, you know, I can't stop you from doing that. And I wouldn't want to stop you from doing that. I would ask, though, if you are going to work with somebody, work with somebody else that's in the class now rather than go back to somebody who took it before, because I will tell you they didn't do this assignment. And now you're trusting them to test to trust their memory. But give it your best shot. I want you to try to fill in the blanks on the slides that remain, and it'll describe it in the assignment. And then when you're done with that, translate that into an essay. And I kind of go over how I want you to do that in the, in the assignment. Um, if you run into issues, give me a call uh, or text me and tell me I'm really lost and I will talk you off the ledge. I am not going to grade these things until we talk about them when we meet next and give you the opportunity the next week to go ahead and edit them. But you do need to take your best shot this week and see how it, see how it turns out. And then when we discuss it with everybody else, you'll get fresh ideas about how to do it and then we'll refine it. So the week ahead, if you have any issues, text me, call me. Um, I may be away on a business trip, but I can I can certainly be reached and will certainly try to call you as soon as I can or text you back or whatever. Um, just don't be afraid of this assignment. When you get in there, you say, gosh, I don't know if I'm doing this right or not. Man, I'm really struggling here. Let me, let me, maybe it's, this is what he's asking for. Go with your gut. I really want you to go with your gut. I want you to examine those those items, those functions and sub-functions of the IT slides that we did not finish out and tell me what you think some of those risks or some of those conversations, those ESRM conversations with IT should be asking about. That's really what it's all about. So do the work. We'll adjust it when we meet. With that, have a great week. I look forward to having some of you call me. Others just go out there and you know fall back in the crowd and see how it turns out. I'm really excited about seeing some of these assignments. And if there are a darn mess when we're done, well, gosh darn it, we're going to clean them up the next week anyway. So um, have at it and do your best. Have a great week, everybody.